so we'll save that for later. All right, queued up and ready to go. Yeah. We're good. We're good. All right. Yeah, we're good. We're live. So again, uh, this is Chad Ramey on Hacking the Atom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's first of all, it's been great to see people that I've uh, talked to at conventions before. Um, so, if you've seen one of my talks at DragonCon or uh, Freaknik, um, this time this talk is new and improved with more nuclear physics. Yay, nuclear physics! Um, so, there will be something new for everyone. Um, feel free to stop me at any point in the talk. Um, I'm going to try to go into as much detail as I can without going into too much detail and without being too complex. Um, um, and hopefully everyone will have a good time and uh, nothing will explode. Uh, we've all heard of trust exercises, yes, like trust falls. Thank you. Uh, this is more of a, uh, this is like a, a nuclear trust exercise. Uh, so, uh, but it, it should be a good time. I'll uh, begin with an introduction. Uh, most commonly I get the, asked the question, uh, why are, are you doing this? Why do you have a nuclear reactor? Why have you spent so much money doing this? Uh, I'll sort of address that, yeah, science for sure. Um, well, I'm going to attempt to explain nuclear fusion and nuclear physics in about 10 minutes. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'll talk about how this reactor works. I'll talk about the particle accelerator that I'm currently designing um, to hopefully generate antimatter in my garage. Uh, we'll do a demo and we'll have some questions. Uh, so hopefully it will be a good time. If I can figure out how to advance the slides. I guess I'll go with the button. So anyways, uh, I suppose an introduction is in order. I'm Chad Ramey, as they mentioned. Uh, I'm currently serving out my time at Georgia Tech as a sophomore of computer science at the moment. Uh, in my free time, I work at a place on Georgia Tech campus called the Invention Studio. I uh, work as an undergraduate laboratory instructor. I basically make sure mechanical engineering students don't mess up our really nice machines. Uh, I'm a 3D printer master, meaning that I maintain a fleet of like 15 3D printers printers that we have there on campus, so if you're ever on Georgia Tech and you want to tour of a really cool machine shop, you can always uh, hit me up and I'll show you around. Uh, as hobbies, I play lots of music. I like drifting my car. Uh, this is a picture of me drifting with my, one of my friends running in terror. Um, and nuclear physics, uh, which has been sort of an odd hobby of mine, but uh, perhaps the most gratifying of all of my hobbies. So why do I do nuclear physics? Uh, first of all, to learn. Uh, someone yelled science. I think that's one of my favorite. Science. Yeah, thank you. OK, we got that going on. Um, so it's to, sci to do science, to science, as one should say. Um, and when I was in high school, I got really, really bored with classes. Um, I felt like I wasn't really learning anything. It was all super basic. And by junior year, I was like, I want to do something uh, big. I want to generate real data. I want to do an experiment that actually proves something or explores something different. Um, so after about a year or so of thinking about this, I found a website called Fuser.net. Um, so if you're interested in anything I talk about today, check out Fuser.net. It's a great resource. It's where I started to learn all my stuff from. found Fuser.net and saw that people were building these nuclear reactors in their garage. And I said, hey, that sounds like a cool idea. Um, and after about six months of convincing my parents, they thought, hey, yeah, that's a cool idea. So um, four years later, it's it's here in front of us. Uh, it took about three years to build, um, but I'll go into that a little later. Um, you know you can use the arrow keys, right? I tried you. Oh, okay. I can use the arrow keys. Cool beans. Uh, <laughs> I tried using up and down, but apparently it's side. Uh, anyways. I really like doing this because at, at a point you start realizing that you are actually tampering with the things that make up everything. And um, I don't know if it's a weird power kick or something like that, but the fact that you can turn a switch and actually do things with atoms is oddly uh, gratifying to me. Um, I think humankind is advancing the point where we're growing past our uh, energy supply. And I think we're going to need something in the future or very near future, um, fission or fusion. I think nuclear is the way to go for us. Um, particularly with fusion, recently there's been Fukushima Daiichi and Chernobyl. Um, I think these reactors can touch on a lot of the safety issues of uh, traditional fission reactors and almost uh, kind of be implemented in ways to solve them. I'll talk that a, a little bit more later on. Um, and of course, fusion is clean and renewable. So before I go into all the maths, 
Let's cover some bases. Um, atoms, small particles that make up everything, consist of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Science. Uh, isotopes are atoms with different, uh, they basically have variations in their neutrons. Uh, ions are charged atoms. So normally the universe favors a sort of order, and atoms and other particles will uh, tend to group themselves in systems that are at a sort of equilibrium. So atoms will tend to have a number of electrons and protons that are balanced out so that they carry a neutral charge. They're not charged positively or negative. Um, the nice thing about that is if we apply a little bit of brute force, we can knock off some electrons and they become charged and we can do things with them. And that's what powers this reactor I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so normally hydrogen, uh, perhaps the most simple element, um, one of one of the ones that's essential to our life here, uh, has one proton and one neutron. It's very, very, or one proton and one electron, excuse me. It's very, very simple, but the fact that it has one proton and one electron means that the charge balances each other out, and it's neutral and very, very stable. So if you give it enough energy, yeah, it is going to probably do something, but it's not like, hey, yeah, I want to hit other stuff and do cool things. Um, however, deuterium has a neutron in its nucleus, so um, the combination of the proton and the neutron, uh, hydrogen starts feeling a little uneasy. It's like it's eaten too much or uh, just totally like binge drink or something and it's unstable and it needs to get rid of some mass. Um, so deuterium is like an optimal uh, sort of nuclear research fuel. Uh, deuterium is to fusion as uranium or plutonium is to fission. It's just really, really great. It wants to break down. And uh, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. So uh, these are just sort of basic diagrams uh, underlying what, what happens in fusion and fission reactions. The difference here is, is fission reactions usually take something really, really big like uranium or plutonium and you're breaking it down into smaller components because it's so massive it wants to break apart. Um, and usually that can be done by just taking a piece of uranium, bombarding it with neutrons and it starts, uh, starts fissioning. And uh, this can actually be used as a neutron source to do that sort of thing, um, which is what I'll talk about at the very end on how fusion reactors can improve fission reactors, but uh, fusion, you take something like deuterium or tritium or helium-3, and um, since they're small and unstable, what they end up tending to do is want to clump together to make bigger things. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, really, really heavy and massive things want to get lighter until they get stable, and really, really light things want to get heavier until they get stable, and everything has a tendency of going down this, uh, this hill to a valley. Uh, made of elements like lead and uh, iron. They're very, very stable elements, perhaps most stable in the universe. So if you're fusioning, you're always getting bigger towards lead or iron. If you're fissioning, you're always getting smaller to lead or iron until you get to something stable. So, you know, like if you do a fission reaction and you get some plutonium out, it's going to decay for billions of years until it gets down to iron. Um, this stuff, deuterium, isn't inherently radioactive. It's, it's kind of stable. You actually have to put a, a little bit of force in to actually start it along that nuclear pathway. Um, so deuterium will not decay like that. However, you can produce things like tritium through the fusion process that will be inherently radioactive and break down sort of later on down the line. Um, essential to know, um, this reactor combines deuterium, like I said earlier, and there are two reaction pathways in the system. So about 50% of the time you'll put two deuterium atoms together and get out tritium and a proton. Um, like I said, tritium is another form of hydrogen and uh, it's inherently radioactive. It's a pretty cool thing. They used to use tritium everywhere in like exit signs because if you put it inside of a, uh, a certain type of polycarbonate tube, the uh, decay of the tritium would actually produce light when the particles traveled through the tubes, but um, it's so tightly regulated by the government now that almost no one can get a hold of tritium um, unless you're at a really fancy research lab, which I am not in my uh, and I'm in my garage, so it's very hard to get tritium. There are clever hacks for getting tritium, however they are very illegal. Um, and so the other pathway is uh, generates helium-3 and a neutron, and the cool thing about helium-3 is it's one of the most uh, rare elements right now. Uh, it's a gas that's used in a lot of things. Uh, most importantly, it's used in uh, neutron detectors, and uh, the DOD 
a lot of other federal agencies have been buying helium-3 detectors like crazy now because they use them to scan uh, shipping containers that are coming in to the United States for fissile material and nuclear bombs and stuff like that. So not only is there a shortage of helium-3, it's usually produced when uh, companies or countries will reprocess uh, spent nuclear waste into plutonium for bombs. Thankfully, not many people are doing that anymore, so we aren't producing much helium-3. Um, these uh, reactors can actually produce helium-3. Uh, to give you an idea of how uh, little nuclear stuff is actually going on in one of these systems, you would have to run one of these at steady state for just over 100,000 years to actually have enough helium-3 in the chamber to be detected by a mass spectrometer, a uh, very, very sensitive instrument. So it's, it's cool to think about, yeah, you're making a detector roll over uh, from the number of counts you're getting, but on an atomic scale, you're doing things with uh, you know individual atoms, and you're only generating one atom at a time, so it's very hard to detect that. And it's very hard to get from one atom to a detectable or usable amount of gas. Um, the interesting thing is, is that this could be a repetitive fuel cycle, though. If you had a reactor, that was operating at break-even efficiency, you would be generating so much helium-3 and tritium that those could just be put back into the plasma and those would be burned as further fusion fuels, almost like a fission reactor does with you can adjust the, uh, the fuel rods into different configurations as they get down the decay chain. Um, that's one of the really cool things about fusion reactors. So now for the new and improved nuclear physics portion of the talk. Um, Basically, if, if you take like a, a physics one course in college, these are sort of your bread and butter. Uh, rest energy, we all, we all recognize E is equal to mc squared, something Einstein was famous for. Um, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, uh, velo v being velocity, m being mass. And then electric uh, potential is equal to a constant times the charge of two things divided by their distance from each other. Um, and when you look at a system, you analyze it from uh, kinetic energy and potential energy, and in a closed system, those two things should cancel each other out. Um, so when you look at a fusion system, there's a certain amount of kinetic energy that you have to put on them to overcome the electric energy that they're pushing each other apart. Um, everything inside of the chamber is ionized, so you have a bunch of positive stuff floating around, and it's just like taking two uh, you know, north or south poles of a magnet and trying to push them together. At a certain point, that electrical charge will uh, force them to not come in contact with each other, and that's exactly what you want to happen. Uh, you need to get them to actually touch, to actually fuse and do all the nuclear cool stuff that you want to happen. So um, per deuterium ion, it takes actually a pretty small amount of energy to actually get that fusion to happen. But this is per ion, so if you were to multiply this out by you know, Avogadro's number, uh, which is 10 to the 23 orders of magnitude, this number gets really, really large. Um, and so you do have to put in a lot of energy into these systems to actually get the most minute amount out. Uh, however, if you take the, the product equation of the system, so if you add up the rest energy of the deuterium that you're putting in along with its electric potential, and then you take the helium-3 and a neutron produced on the helium-3 side of the equation, these will equal up to this number, which multiplied by Avogadro's number is substantially huge. Uh, joules per mole is equivalent to watts per second, so you're essentially uh, generating a very, very large amount of electricity if you were to actually be doing a mole's worth of fusion. Okay, so I promise no more math after that. Uh, I just kind of got on a math kick last night and I was like, yeah, I'm going to put in nuclear physics into the talk. Um, but essentially there are a couple of different ways fusion can work. Um, IEC is, is what my reactor is sort of powered off of and what that means is since we have a bunch of ions floating around in the chamber and they're all positively charged, it's literally as simple as putting something negatively charged in the center of the chamber and it will attract all of the positively charged stuff. Uh, so you have a bunch of ions floating around and you put a big enough voltage in it, it's going to suck all of them towards the center and form what is essentially a star. I'll show it to you in just a little bit. 
Um, we also have magnetic confinement and inertial confinement. Uh, magnetic confinement has been sort of in the news as well as inertial confinement recently. There's a big project in France called ITER, um, which is due to break even uh, in 2030, meaning that France is planning by 2050 to have fusion power plants. Uh, they want to phase out all fission and have fusion power plants and be entirely fusion powered. Uh, the problem with ITER is that it's like a $15 billion experiment. Uh, um, and with the European Union over there, they don't get much funding rolling in all the time, and they have cutbacks, and so it's not really going very well for them. Inertial confinement is actually, it seems like something out of a James Bond movie. Um, we have a facility in the United States called the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, uh, where we have the most powerful laser in the world. We shoot it at a tiny pellet of deuterium, which is the fuel, in a uh, cylinder made of gold, like the purest gold that they can basically synthesize. Um, and they shoot the laser at a certain angle that it generates a lattice of x-rays. And this lattice of x-rays moves in to crush the deuterium pellet and put it into fusion. Um, but the fact that they're using x-rays in a lattice configuration always makes me laugh. Um, and as I said, IEC uses electricity, and the thing with IEC that makes it so great is that you don't need a superconducting magnet like uh, ITER uses or magnetic confinement uses. You just need a really big power supply, which is actually pretty easy to get. When I was first starting off, I was like, how in the world do I take 120 volts from a house outlet and get it to 50,000 volts? It was like baffling to me at the time because I was a junior in high school and I did not know anything about high voltage. However, when I started getting into research, it's very easy to go out and buy a neon sign transformer off of Craigslist and make a couple of mul voltage multipliers and get up to the point where you could be doing fusion. Actually, at one point, I uh, got on Craigslist and found a guy who was closing his neon shop, and he sold me 40 neon sign transformers for $20. So I always tell people uh, when I do these talks that if anyone's getting started in fusion, I have a garage full of neon sign transformers that my parents are you know, threatening to throw away. Um, yeah, and you can use them for Tesla coils too. So email me if you want neon sign transformers because I have too damn many. Um, but basically what happens is uh, when you suck the ions together with enough electricity, you literally get a mass of ions flying around that are hotter than the interior of our sun. Um, which is, is really phenomenal to, to think about. A lot of people say, oh, you're not doing fusion in your garage. You have to be in the millions of degrees. And I'm like, yes, I'm at 103 million degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so it's hard to think of this, but the very fact that this could happen is due to the electric field and the fact that you don't have that much stuff at that high of a temperature. And so if you have any ions escaping from that, literally if they have just collide with an air particle, they neutralize so quickly because of the te uh, temperature gradient between them. Um, but the things in there are uh, the things that you'll see emitting light, uh, the little star inside is basically hotter than the sun if it were actually doing fusion. So uh, sort of a, a schematic of a system not unlike mine, um, just to show you what's going on before I actually start turning dials and stuff. Um, you have a vacuum chamber um, of which I have two vacuum pumps hooked up to. I have a two-stage mechanical pump, which is what you hear sort of gargling right now uh, in the background, and it's, it just sort of roughs the chamber. It takes out some of the air and it gets it down to a pretty low vacuum, uh, but not low enough to actually do cool nuclear or stuff. Um, the best analog I, I usually give people or analogy is that it's like uh, taking two cars at the end of a runway and you're told to stick the cars together but at the same time you have a bunch of motorcycles or buses going back and forth across the runway. Um, so envision the cars as your deuterium and the buses and the motorcycles as air particles. It's very hard to imagine those cars being able to hit each other if you have air in the chamber or motorcycles or buses going across the runway. Way. So what you do is you remove all the air so you just have the fuel and it's more likely to collide. And this is called optimizing the cross section basically. Um, so we take that pump and then I have another one that's hanging off the side of the cart here um, and that's called a oil vapor diffusion pump and essentially it's got a boiler on the bottom that gets up to about 220 degrees uh, Celsius. It boils an oil on the inside of the, the system. Um, 
the oil shoots up and hits a plate at the top of the pump and since there's no air in the system to uh, have friction or anything like that, the vapor streams end up traveling back down into the bottom of the pump at supersonic velocities and that velocity is high enough to create a shift through the chamber to sort of drag out the rest of the air. Um, so basically with the combination of these two pumps I can zero out any standard vacuum gauge you have. It's, it's a really, really solid system and out of the whole system it's probably what's taken me the longest to develop. I've spent about two and a half years just working on vacuum systems. Uh, I know entirely too much about vacuum now uh, and it's nice to have something that I can set up, flip a switch and it all be down to vacuum pressure within 15 minutes now. But uh, So you have vacuum on one side and then on the other side you have a high voltage uh, power supply which is the big crate that's sitting in the middle of the, the cart there and then on the top of the chamber you have an insulator which is a high voltage feed through. It's basically a glorified spark plug. You have a big piece of ceramic with a copper piece going through it um, and that's what allows you to put the 50,000 volts into the chamber. Um, you of course have a vacuum gauge so you know what sort of uh, pressure you're at, a radiation meter, duh, um, a uh, neutron detector if you're trying to, to um, get neutrons out of the system and then uh, a fuel uh, a fuel regulator um, this is, is an, another uh, engineering challenge. I don't actually have the fuel on today because I'm not going to bombard everyone with neutrons. Uh, was, the dosage that this puts out is not necessarily anywhere near dangerous. However, um, it's, it's very hard to actually get it to the point where it starts generating neutrons and it would take much more than 30 minutes just to get the system stable enough to be you know, at a constant state generating uh, nuclear fusion. So generally I just freak everyone out with x-rays in these talks and uh, it's good for a laugh. Uh, so uh, when you put it all together, this is sort of what you get. Um, these are pictures from my senior uh, science experiment when I was still in high school. I did an experiment called the effects of cathode composition on inertial electrostatic confinement fusion reactors. It was a lot of fun. I got to go up to North Georgia College and use all of their labs to do my research. Um, this is actually a funny story. The first year I did science fair, I had dreams of going to international science fair. I got all the way to state science fair and ended up winning grand prize in physics. I was the only grand prize award winner at state science fair that year to not go to international science fair. And I started talking to people and uh, one of the judges came up to me and he said, so your neutron detector, what are you using? Because they didn't necessarily believe that I was doing uh, fusion in my garage and neutrons are the telltale sign of the fusion reaction actually taking process. And so I, I pulled out a boron 10 lined neutron detector tube. Um, which I had bought for $10 from a nuclear salvage place called the Black Hole in uh, Los Alamos, which sadly is out of business now. But uh, to give you an idea of how old the tube is, it said uh, made for the United States Atomic Energy Commission on the tube. So it's more of an antique than it is functional. But they said, yeah, we're worried about you actually generating neutrons, whether or not you're doing what you, what you say you are. But we'll offer to take you to a college lab and do it on calibrated detectors. So the next year I did. Um, and my experiment ended up making it International Science Fair and it was a really good time. But these are pictures from that experiment. And what I started noticing, um, this is a different grid than you'll see me running today, but basically the two metal lines you see are connected to sort of a rectangular prism type uh, grid made out of titanium. Um, and that's what the electric charge sits on. And uh, in these pictures, you can see the little lines that are flowing into the center of the grid. And that's where all of the particles, uh, the two particles, beams are colliding in the center of the grid there. However, there's an interesting phenomena occurring. You can see around each of the four lot wires there are four little white spots. On the top they're much more defined than they are on the bottom, but those are actually pockets of electrons. And what, what's happening there is the grid is heating up so much that it's breaking down at an atomic level and emitting electrons. And so when the particles hit them they confine them into those little circles around the grid. Um, but that process of confining is actually constricting the ions and making the whole process uh, inefficient. And so I was trying to 
minimize that emission of electrons and my experiment ended up changing the material of the grid and we were able to reduce that emission by 20,000 percent which was it, w it was a fun experiment and thankfully it was really successful but it, basically what's happening is the ions are going in elliptical paths in and out of that center they they get attracted in and if they don't if they don't collide and fuse together they bounce out really quick and as soon as they get sort of to the exterior of the chamber they start feeling sucked back in again so you get a process of just continual flowing in and out of the center of the chamber and it's it's that process that really makes these reactors so great because uh, even though there is inefficiency that prevents them from fusing every time you're recycling your fuel and it's just going back through again so it's a it's a pretty um, it's a very simple yet very functional design. Now the problem with these that will make them never break even is the fact that you actually have that grid there. Because you're exposing that grid to potentially millions of degrees Fahrenheit, it's breaking down, like I said, at an atomic level. And every time it breaks down, you get things other than fuel into the plasma. So you have titanium ions and electrons getting in there, and that's just like the bus is going across the runway. Uh, it's going to destroy the reaction, essentially. So. That's a problem. If you could make that invisible and not break down on an atomic scale, then this would break even. I would be a multi-billionaire. We would all be uh, living off of deuterium from seawater in our reactors, and uh, we would have no more war, and everything would be great. Uh, sadly, that's not the case, but I'll do a cool demo. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically turn on the diffusion pump. I'll light up a plasma. One of my favorite things to do with a system that is not uh, involving fusion is to actually observe the change of the plasma as it sucks down into vacuum. Um, so I'll let the, the system go all the way back up to near air. We'll start up a plasma and watch how it changes as the vacuum pressure um, decreases. And, and what you'll see is that uh, it'll go from like a very undefined sort of area all the way down to a very defined sort of star. We'll start to see those beams like the picture that I had, um, and it'll be pretty cool. At a certain point, we'll get to a vacuum level where I'll have to add more and more voltage. Uh, we'll get over 10,000 volts, and it'll start generating x-rays, and I've got the Geiger counter down here. Now, disclaimer, I know x-rays are scary. However, uh, at 10,000 volts, this does not generate a strong enough x-ray to pierce the uh, stainless steel of the chamber. So the only area where x-rays will come out is the glass that's on the side of the chamber facing me. I'm going to be on the other side. So uh, whoever happens to be behind this wall may get a little bit of a dose, but not much. So it shouldn't hurt them, and uh, they won't know about it. So that's all right. Ignorance is bliss. Uh, so let's, let's see if we can make a star. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, something I, I failed to mention, uh, <laughs> this design was actually pioneered by Philo Farnsworth. Yeah, let me change it over to the... This design was actually pioneered by Philo Farnsworth, who is, uh, he was the inventor of the modern television as we sort of know it. Uh, he envisioned this design when he was uh, in his teenage years, um, and it's, it just works really well. Um, but essentially what I'm going to do now, hopefully this doesn't start feeding back, um, I've turned this valve off, so this is the vacuum gauge, and hopefully the pressure is going to come up a little bit, um, but I'll go ahead and turn the voltage on, and we should see some plasma there. Um, so this, this is a really cool sort of mode that the plasma gets into, and... <laughs> Or, sorry, something that's being really researched right now. This little beam right here is called a bugle jet, and that's a high-density beam of electrons. Um, I interned at NASA this summer, and I was showing a couple of physicists uh, images that I had taken of, of the reactor, and so they were asking me questions, just sort of testing my knowledge, and they're like, do you know what that is? And I said, yeah, it's a high-density stream of electrons. It's called a bugle jet. And they said, exactly. We're researching this right now in the Advanced Propulsion Division because this this is the sort of uh, dense stream of electrons that will provide a very high impulse in an electronic space thruster. Uh, so it's this type of discharge that's actually being explored by uh, NASA and a couple of other interstellar flight um, divisions and research uh, labs for propelling spacecraft with electrical systems. Now uh, NASA is actually working with a company called EMC Squared that was uh, started by a guy who originally
originated with this type of fusion research. Um, and they're hoping to build a fusion reactor that they can actually draw these streams of electrons off of. So the fusion reactor will both provide electricity to power the spacecraft as well as have these electron streams jetting out the back of it that will propel the aircraft, I mean the uh, spacecraft forward. And uh, it's really great because once you start going, there isn't any really friction in space to stop you. And these drives could potentially uh, get up to the point where they could drive us very near light speed. Um, is there any way we can get the lights off? It'll look much, much better and more clear. We're getting a little bit of reflection. <laughs> Darn it. Okay, so this is where it should get exciting. I'm going to turn the valve and the vacuum pressure will start to drop and we should see some changes uh, in the way it looks. At the same time, I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, the Geiger counter on and I'll try to stand to the other side of it so we can watch as the uh, as the uh, as the the discharge changes. Another cool thing you'll start to see is white dots on the camera screen. Uh, that means that there are high energy gamma rays hitting the camera sensor. And uh, since the camera sensor is not 100% chemically pure, it has some phosphors and things like that in it. The phosphors in the camera sensor are actually scintillating, uh, producing light because they're hit by high energy photons. Um, and CERN, uh, the, the research agency that has the LHC, has recently built a, a, an array out of actually the same cameras that are used in the iPhone 4GS uh, or 4S because they found that those sensors are particularly chemically impure and they're really great to responding to high energy photons. So they're actually using a, a sensor sort of like that at the LHC right now, which is kind of interesting as well. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn on the high vacuum pump as well, but. Um, I'm going to set the microphone down for one second. So, is it safe to have that kind of jet pointed at somebody? Huh? Is it safe to have that jet pointed at somebody? Pointed at somebody? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's. So the thing is, is. In a system like a spacecraft, you would be able to focus this, and these would really easily focus since the electrons are charged. You can focus them with an electrostatic or a magnetic field, uh, which would be really, really easy to do. Um, so they're not really a huge concern for, in terms of if they would ever be pointing at someone. You wouldn't want this to be pointing at the glass because it's in fact very, very hot. Uh, so that part of the chamber may get red hot at, uh, if I were to let this run for five or 10 minutes just because of how hot they are. However, the chamber is grounded. So at some point, the electrons are going to have a little bit of a deflection from the chamber um, since it's grounded. Um, they want to... Microphone. What? Oh, yeah, sorry, I should have picked this up. Um, they will deflect a little bit from the chamber so it doesn't get that hot. Um, but it's very rare this, that this would ever be pointed to a person. Um, the thing that you would have to worry about is if these electrons were at a high enough speed, which they're not right now, you would have to actually design a system particularly to do this. You could shoot them up to a high enough speed and then hit them on metal and you would be producing quite a lot of x-rays, but we aren't at that voltage yet to actually do that and as we get to the voltage to do that since you're focusing everything more and more you lose this bugle jet in a little bit um, so I'm going to turn on high vacuum pump and hopefully that will happen where is this happening right now? see the glowing bit there? yeah All right, so uh, they just asked where this is happening right now. And so basically, the white thing from the top of the chamber, that is the high voltage feed through. There's a rod going through that into the sort of center of this vacuum chamber at the top here, and the grid is inside of that. All right, so our vacuum pressure is going to plummet a little bit. Right now, we're at like three kilovolts, so we're barely putting any power into this thing. Um, 
but as the vacuum pressure goes down, uh, basically what's happening is you're having to put more and more electricity in because there's not, a mu not much stuff to carry current inside of the chamber. So you're having to use more voltage. Uh, and as it drops, I'll put more voltage on, and then we should see the Geiger counter start counting. It's not really biased properly right now, so don't freak out that it's actually counting. Uh, but we should see a different in difference in counts as soon as the uh, x-rays start to roll out. It will be very noticeable. So what would be a number on that? Hmm? Oh, so, so probably when we start generating x-rays, that, that count will, will scale over many times in a minute. Uh, so that's... Yeah, it, if you didn't see the talk introduction, it's a, it's a bring your own lead shielding talk, so I hope you all took care of that. Um, what you're saying is that as you get smarter as years go on, you're going to die earlier. No, no, I, uh, I have a, I have a lead uh, under shielding on. <laughs> no, um, I actually don't run this quite, uh, quite that often, mainly because tech sec sucks all of the life out of me, and I have like no time for nuclear research anymore, just coding. <laughs> Yeah. It just sort of weirds people out, so I try to stay away from it. I started glowing at one point, and my friends were like, man, this is weird. You need to stop. Uh, <laughs> I was just saying, I'm sure your girlfriend loves that you have two dicks now. Yeah, it's, it's an introduction. It's a, it's a nice party icebreaker. So, um, and the other thing is, when I when I was doing the research experiments where I'm generating very very high fluxes of neutrons, we'll do the we'll do the reactor in pulses. So it'll be like a 30 second pulse, and that helps you standardize the voltage and stuff you're putting into the chamber. But also, it's it's less data since you're dealing with like six to eight variables. You know, vacuum pressure, current, voltage. You have to keep your runs very short, else you just have you know tons of data that's just very very hard to deal with. Charles is sitting next to you out there because we don't need children or anything. <laughs> I'm not using them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, go stand in front of the thing. All right, so the pressure is going to start to drop here. We've got we've got a little bit of rise in pressure because when the oil starts to boil, it uh, it boils off the water vapor. So. Um, We'll start to hear a ticking noise in a couple of seconds. I just started to hear it, and that's basically the oil coming down and hitting the walls. Once that ticking sound happens, uh, the pressure is just going to drop like a stone. Um, probably what will happen is it will get very bright. The uh, x-rays will, will fly up, and um, I'll have to scramble to the other side to adjust the vacuum pump back down so we can actually keep a plasma in the chamber. <laughs> And again, this is all stainless steel back here, so there's no x-rays coming this way, mainly just towards the camera. I, have, I call the camera the gamma cam. Uh, it's, it's the sacrificial uh, piece of the whole system. The gam cam, yeah. It's the gamma. The, the other cool thing about this system in particular is that I can set my power supply to about 50%, which is you know 25,000 volts. Um, and once it gets down to pressure where the high vacuum pump is running, I can just turn the knob on the top of the high vacuum pump and regulate it to the pressure I want it to be at. And the voltage and amperage will correspond to that pressure. Basically, it, it sort of self-regulates to a point uh, just because of how everything is sort of working inside with the in, internal uh, the voltage and current that the plasma is actually carrying itself. The plasma is actually charged. Is there any additional danger that you've got a monitor behind you that's reflecting all that shit back out here? Not necessarily. Um, <laughs> most of these... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's. You're done having kids. There, there's, there's pretty much no backscattering with these types of these. This type of X-ray is called Bremsstrahlung X-ray. Um, it's a very, very, very weak X-ray. That's why it doesn't come through the stainless steel to begin with. Basically, glass and paper, like very uh, sparse materials. Anything dense is going to uh, scatter them or break them up. Um, and the other thing is, you have the inverse square wall law on your side, so the farther you are away from it, the less of the so you're dosage you're getting. I'm on this side of it, so I'm alright. I was going to say, it sounds like you have hamsters in here. 
Okay. Yeah, so it's starting to drop a little now. Um, yeah, haha, -ha, cancer, April Fools. <laughs> All right, so our pressure is starting to drop. Um, I'll watch the voltage, and um, when I see it go to 10K, I'll direct all of you. Does anyone want to volunteer to hold the Geiger counter up so we can all see the count? Does anyone want to volunteer to be a Geiger counter? <laughs> all right. It's at 250 and climbing. I think that's not good. Oh, holy shit, 381. All right, so there we go. Wait, 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 wait. I got to adjust the vacuum pressure here. Oh, well, well, I need to get video of this shit. But you, you can... <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Sorry, this is where it becomes kind of hands-on when it starts getting a really high voltage. But basically, you can see now that the plasma is much more focused. We have that one beam coming out of the right side, and it's much brighter in that smaller area, meaning that it's doing exactly what it should be doing. That, that little ball of light in the center, if we had fuel in here, would basically be a star. Is it just me, or is it? Uh, what should we do? Well, do? Expand <laughs> rapidly. Well, that's my point. What is going on inside? Demo goes bad. <laughs> When I say, uh, and let down the mic and run out the room, that's when you should probably run to. Uh, that right there, if you just hold it up a little bit. No, no, that. Yeah, there you go. So people can see that. It's a very expensive demo. Shit, that thing is going up fast. What the fuck? Hold on. All right, so right now we're at 15,000 volts. It's pretty stable. Um, but I saw a couple of white dots on the camera display at first, but... It's coming back down now. Oh, did you see those white dots? It's very hard to sort of manage the high. Not yet. Where's the anti It's still working on it. I forgot to bring the flux capacitor for the black hole, so. Hey, the Geiger counter slowed down. We'll do that next year or something. We'll do that at DragonCon. That'll be exciting in front of all those people. What number should we be I wouldn't stand in front of that at the moment. Probably not. It's, it's not really taking up. All right, so we're coming up on 10K again. It should be picking up soon. It's going back up again really fast. Yeah, there we go. I think the feed froze again. There we go. It's going back. It's over 200 as he stands in front of It's like. It's over 200 Yeah, there we go. So, to give you an idea of just how, you know, radiation should always be taken seriously, but to give you an idea of how low of a dose, even with this amount of x-rays pouring out of it, uh, when I was doing my research at North Georgia College, uh, the professor several times during the run would just move the camera and look straight in it. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, he's old, and that's why he is. Yeah, probably, but... Yeah, he's like 27, he's almost dead. So. I, I always like, uh, you know, having more safety precautions than necessary, and this is certainly observed with the gamma cam, but... And we appreciate uh, that. <laughs> why does my jaw feel funny? What about the person in the room next to Do we need those little black <laughs> tags to put on our collars? The, they're all right. The The wall is dense enough to, oh, to stop any extra. 300,000. <laughs> and counting. Um, and what numbers? That is disconcerting. <laughs> it counts up as of what those like. Have you tried to fly with this yet? That's what I was going to say. This has been on an airplane, actually, uh, in a steel briefcase. I uh, flew it to L.A. for the International Science Fair, and I carried it on the airplane. I can't have nail clippers, but you can take a fusion. <laughs> no, I think that would have freaked them out a little bit too much. Yeah, when I go through TSA, this is a research vacuum chamber. That's what it is. It's just not specifically what it's researched. Yeah. Don't worry, they understand exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So you're telling me I can't have nail clippers, but you can take a fusion reactor on a plane? Yeah. I was... <laughs>
Because those nail clippers can hurt someone. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, you, you would really be surprised what you can take on planes. Uh, you know, uranium is just fossils. Uh, no. <laughs> Something you ate. <laughs> I, I think the uh, you pull your water out, but this guy with a nuclear fission device, he's cool. <laughs> I think the, mo the most trouble I've had with anything has been a vacuum valve. They like really, really freaked out a valve. You guys in the front row are bald now. <laughs> this is not a good sign. Everyone run. 500,000. Yeah, but that's that's the system, and does this machine give you superpowers? We we haven't tried yet. Quite possibly, though. Last year, last year at Dragon Con, we tried to convince Stan Lee to sit next to it to actually give Stan Lee superpowers. He he didn't come to the talk though, so that was kind of upsetting. Maybe this year. Are you sure this won't hurt us? Yeah. Yeah, no, it counts up. That's what's like out there. Like, you're good. Everything's going this way, so you're, you're fine. So that's cool. That's definitely going to work out well for you. So that's a that's a brief overview of fusion for you. Thank you. All right, right so, now you're not working on it at all? Uh, right now, uh, thank you, that's an excellent transition. Uh, I'll finish up as quick as I can. Uh, so basically, back in the day, the first particle accelerators ever, ever made were these things called uh, cyclotrons. So uh, traditionally, particle accelerators are called linux, uh, linear uh, particle accelerators, and they're big tubes. And the principle is you apply electrical current at regular intervals down the tube. And every time you apply that electric current, you accelerate the particles that much more. So as you're going down the tube, um, they accelerate more. And so uh, very quickly, the limitation of the system becomes how long your tube can be. Uh, you know, just like every system. Uh, however, there were some clever physicists who said, well, what if we just make the tube circular? Um, and basically what they came up with was a cyclotron. Um, in, in physics, we know that uh, magnetic fields can basically bend the path of a particle. So instead of having an electric field that's just shooting a particle straight, you put that electric field in the middle of two really, really strong magnets. I mean like super strong magnets, and it gets the particle to go in circles. Um, <clears throat> so basically, I have, this, I have this diagram. The LHC is technically a linear accelerator. It's just just in a circle. Um, so it's kind of like a cyclotron in the fact that they can bring the beams over the same course over and over again, um, but it, it's not technically a cyclotron. Um, but basically, you have this chamber made of non-magnetic material in between two magnets, and you have an electrical field that goes uh, at opposite polarities. It's a square wave, basically. just oscillates back and forth in between two plates. And so you have a positive particle that gets sucked back and forth these two plates. At the same time, the particle is traveling in a, a spiral path towards the outside of the chamber. It starts in the center and goes towards the outside. The strength of your magnetic field is what determines how many of you can go around the circle before uh, the particle exits the chamber. So these are generally made with really, really strong electromagnets in the range of like 0.8 to 2 Teslas, and that's basically about the same strength of your average MRI. Um, so getting that sort of magnet as an amateur is very, very hard, and they take a whole lot of electricity. Um, so there's been a couple of people on the internet, I, I think I'm the fourth now, to start designing what we're calling microcyclotrons. Uh, and essentially the principle is, since neodymium permanent magnets have gotten so strong now, you can basically, for $300, uh, buy two magnets with a, they each have a pull force of about 550 pounds, meaning that you could pick up a 550 pound object with one of them. Um, and you, you put them inside of a, a little metal uh, piece, it's called a yoke, 
yoke, sort of like a uh, sort of like a transformer yoke. And so you sandwich these neodymium magnets, and and you actually get a uh, magnetic field at the range you need it to be, it's just very, very small. Uh, so the whole challenge then becomes getting the chamber that small and then having a very, very high frequency and high power RF circuit to actually oscillate the particles back and forth fast enough. Um, so right now I'm working on CAD drawings to build the uh, cyclotron and hopefully this is what I will be, I'll be presenting all of my designs and some of the maths behind the cyclotron at DragonCon and maybe even a demo, but like I said, the end goal of this project is to have a particle accelerator that you could put in a backpack that you can pull out, set on a table, hook it up to your vacuum systems and high voltage and generate uh, antimatter. So uh, it should be interesting. I say that whenever I'm at the urinal. Don't cross the street. So uh, any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I. Uh, did the electric bill go really high, and then your mom goes, "What the fuck happened?" <laughs> Actually, um, <laughs> the computer is is my computer probably takes up more wattage than the reactor does. Actually, so and I was building a phase change cooling system for my computer at the time. So you had the like, yeah, you had the 800 watt computer with the phase change cooling system with two compressors in it. So that really took up the electricity bill much more than the reactor. Reactor did uh, just sort of snuck the reactor and and uh, yeah and so far the reactor hasn't taken much toll on the neighborhood. I have blown the substation in my uh, cul-de-sac once, but we were it was uh, that was an interesting night. <laughs> but it's been it's been a really fun and I always really enjoy giving talks to people because uh, like I said if nuclear uh, anything is really subject to public opinion these days and I feel like not a lot of the public has the chance to see what good nuclear can do and you know words about nuclear other than meltdown Chernobyl and Fukushima so uh, I, I urge you to uh, take another look at nuclear energy because you know especially as computer security people and computer scientists or uh, you know whoever you are you can definitely see our need for for energy these days and I think nuclear is going to be what really propels us into the future but thank you so much it's been quite an honor to speak today and who couldn't use a third nipple